My name is Jason Thompson with the law firm of Summer Schwartz. Today I have with me Rob Ash, a lawyer at our firm, and Veronica Stewart, a paralegal at our firm. Today we're going to talk about wage and hour cases, or what we commonly refer to as wage theft. Wage theft cases uh, are cases in which workers are not being paid for the work that they've done. Rob, can you give us some examples of employment jobs where people aren't paid overtime properly? Sure. You might think of people that work in a call center, customer service representatives, or uh, a, uh, uh, servers in a restaurant, a, a chain of restaurants that um, uh, share tips and things like that. Uh, another example might be a pizza delivery driver or an armored truck driver. So there's really a lot of uh, different groups of people that we're looking at, but generally when we approach one of these cases, we're looking for groups of people that are similarly situated to each other. And what does the law require, whether it's federal or state law, for people to be paid properly? Can you give us some examples of what uh, the law requires employers to comply with? Sure. Well, the first thing that comes to mind is the uh, overtime uh, requirement of the Fair Labor Standards Act. And what that requires is that anytime a non-exempt employee is working over 40 hours a week, they need to be paid an overtime premium of one and one half times the regular hourly rate. Now, do some states have different thresholds for payment of overtime? That's a good question, and there are many states. For example, California. Not only does uh, California have a requirement for 40 hours a week, but they also have a daily overtime requirement. So anytime you work over eight hours a, in a day, or even 12 hours in a day, there are different premiums associated with um, uh, those daily overtime requirements. Does the law uh, protect things like taking a rest or having lunch? Absolutely. In certain states, there are uh, many requirements for uh, taking uh, rest breaks at certain intervals and also taking meal breaks. Uh, meal breaks we run into a lot of problems with when employees are required to work on their meal breaks. If it's an unpaid meal break, the employee has to be relieved of all job-related activities. Veronica, as a paralegal, I presume you have a lot of contact on a day-to-day -day basis with Summer Schwartz clients? I do. Can you give us an idea of what their concerns typically are in joining a lawsuit for wage theft? Primarily, their concerns have to deal with the length of time of the lawsuit, what is required of them to participate in a lawsuit, and whether they will be retaliated against if they're still employed by that employer. Give us a little idea of what is required of an employee who wants to sue for their unpaid wages. The primary requirement of a person coming forward with a lawsuit is to have been wronged in some way. That's first and foremost. What makes that decision? How does that all work? The attorneys make that decision. It's based on things like uh, how much damages they have actually incurred, the statute of limitations, how long it's been since that incident happened. Veronica, what are some of the client concerns when it comes to retaliation? Mostly the client is concerned about being fired or a change in their pay. That's understandable. When we've had cases in the past, uh, we've had to explain to the clients that, number one, most employers are represented by competent legal counsel. They'll tell them that retaliation or even adverse action, such as reducing hours or making their life miserable, is completely prohibited once a lawsuit's been filed. And I know we've had examples, very rare, where a, an employer has done that, and that has given rise to a whole new cause of action, because under the statute, Robbie, we're able to then file a new claim for that retaliation. Right, and it, it can be a very big problem for an employer, because not only at that point is an employer uh, fighting the merits of a lawsuit, but the statute under the Fair Labor Standards Act, uh, Fair Labor Standards Act uh, provides for attorney fees to a prevailing party. So if an employer goes off and does something, uh, you know, stupid like fires an employee for bringing a lawsuit, they've got a really 
tough uphill climb to defeat the retaliation lawsuit, which also carries with it attorney fees. Rob, you mentioned attorney fees in your last answer. How is it that the lawyers get paid in these cases? Right. So the Fair Labor Standards Act uh, provides for attorney's fees to be paid to uh, the prevailing party. So one way in which an attorney can get paid is uh, for them to be the prevailing party and then they submit their fee petition to the other side for the other side to pay the attorney fees. The other way that an attorney can get paid is uh, by working off of a contingency fee where they take a cut of what is recovered on behalf of the class. Uh, both of these are advantageous to a uh, plaintiff because many of the people that we represent don't have the financial capability to uh, maintain a lawsuit against a major corporation. Uh, both of these options then allow us to allow them to bring a lawsuit and not have to worry about the finances associated with it. Summer Schwartz has been working in this field for over 10 years. Can you give us an idea of the states where we're representing clients currently? I suppose as a practical matter, we represent clients all over the country in all states, but uh, some states have uh, stricter laws for overtime and minimum wage and things like that. For example, New York, uh, Nevada, California is a big one, Washington State. Uh, in those states, we see more cases because there's more laws to protect the employees. Veronica, in your experience, do the clients think that these lawsuits take up a lot of their time? No. Some cases, uh, there's very little for a client to do. However, in other cases, a client may have to appear for an oral examination, answer questions, provide documents, and be available to us. And if you had to estimate over the life of a one or a two year lawsuit, about how many hours does the typical client have to set aside to assist the law firm? Less than five. Jason, how prevalent are these wage violations that we're talking about happening in everyday America? It's hard to quantify because most go unreported. If you think about it, people have to have a job. Uh, they have to have a paycheck they're providing for their family. And the last thing you want to do is jeopardize your livelihood, your ability to provide for your family by complaining to an employer who has the absolute authority to fire you. So first of all, it's hard to quantify, but if you think about running a business, whether it's a restaurant or a plant, you have fixed costs, you have your rent, you have things that you really can't change if you want to stay in business. But what's the one thing that you can control? That's your labor costs. So wage theft is prevalent and it's a tempting uh, act for an employer to take um, to save costs on the one variable they can, which is labor. And it's the most vulnerable component of their workforce because they can't complain. So these cases are very important, which is why there's the attorney fee provision that we talked about earlier. And the liquidated damages provision too for a, a willful violation. That's an excellent point. So the uh, overtime may amount to a thousand dollars and under the law as a penalty to discourage this, that gets doubled. So someone may have what they think is a fairly small case and it could end up becoming quite sizable. And for most people, $2,000 makes a big difference. So, Jason, we talked about uh, uh, the, the willful you mentioned. Uh, it doesn't have to be a willful violation for there to be a violation of the act. An employer may just not realize that they're violating the act, and the employee would still have a claim, right? That's absolutely true. When the original law was passed, it was a jobs creation bill. It was born out of the Depression. And the Fair Labor Standards Act, first and foremost, is to make sure people are employed. And so fault, willfulness, uh, malice, none of that is required for somebody to recover lost wages. All that's required is that you have worked in your job and you haven't been properly paid. So the law does provide double damages, as we've talked about, for willfulness. But in order to have a case and to be owed your wages, that is not part of the uh, part of the burden is to prove something like willfulness or malice. Right, and the purpose uh, I think it was uh, FDR said an honest day's work for an honest, honest day's wage. wage. Yeah, I'd just like to add, Jason, that our clients are thrilled that they've brought an action for something that they thought that could never happen for them. They weren't being paid properly. They knew something was wrong. In the end, it was a win. Let's talk about the different types of job settings where we find violations. One of the big ones that we have 
we call off the clock work. What does that mean? Well, uh, off the clock work is any time an employer uh, employee is doing work related activities and not being compensated for them. Um, for example, uh, a uh, in a call center, someone that is booting up computer programs and shutting down computer programs before they get clocked into the timekeeping system. Um, another example uh, could be uh, drive time. Uh, an employer uh, is uh, not paid in California if they're under the exclusive control of the uh, employer and they're driving, they're not getting paid for that, that might be another violation. Um, if an employee is answering emails, writing emails off the clock, I mean there's a, a variety of different ways that a employee can be doing work that benefits an employer and not getting paid for it, that's what we mean by off the clock. And so that's the real question is whether or not the worker is engaged in the work, the activity that they do on a day-to-day -day basis, and whether they're being paid while they're doing that work. That's right. Another good example that we've come across involves restaurant workers. Not only do they have off-the-clock work, but some of those people are paid through tips. Can the tips become a problem for the employer in our, our cases? Uh, filed to recover tips. Yeah, we see that quite a bit actually. Uh, tip pooling uh, is, is common in the industry, uh, but there are many rules that are associated with tip pooling. The employers oftentimes don't know the rules and many times don't follow the rules. And if they don't file, follow the rules, then it's an improper tip pool and that's a violation of the law. Some industries we see more often than others. For example, the healthcare industry. We've had a lot of cases that involve healthcare workers. One example involves nurses, and nurses are put under a tremendous amount of pressure to work without having been paid properly. We know we've had cases where they've had to work off the clock, and that usually involves their lunch period. So many nurses have reported to us that they work through their lunch period, but their employer actually docks them that half hour, and they're not being paid for. And nurses work long hours generally too. Sometimes they're working three 12 hour shifts. Well, a 12 hour shift in California could be a daily overtime violation. Call centers I know were mentioned earlier. And we've had a lot of examples of call centers. We've had healthcare. What else have we seen? Food processing plants. We have. Let's talk about those for a moment. What's, what are the violations in food processing plants? Well, there are donning and doffing. What does that mean? That means putting on protective gear before and after your shift or before and after your lunch. And they do that without being paid? Yes, they do that without An being paid. An example of another off-the-clock work claim. Exactly. We're in Michigan. It's a manufacturing center, much like the Midwest is. We would have uh, probably a lot of workers that are working in tool and die shops or manufacturing plants, fabrication facilities that are being asked to come in early, stay late. All of those represent examples of wage theft as well. Absolutely. Uh, you know, in uh, both um, off-the-clock settings, and you'd be surprised. Many times employers tell their employees, we're not going to pay you overtime premiums. Uh, or they misclassify them. And when I say misclassify, what I mean is they tell people that they're not entitled to overtime when they actually are entitled to overtime. So. Uh, Job market is changing, Jason, and one of the things that we're seeing a lot of is um, things like Uber, ride sharing, or Lyft, and uh, what they, the quote unquote gig economy. Are there violations present in the gig economy? We have started to uh, focus on that area because what the employers often do is classify those workers as independent contractors. So why is that important? Well, as an independent contractor, you're not entitled to any of the protections under the law that we've been discussing. That means there's no protection for meal breaks, uh, rest periods, there's no protections for minimum wage, and the big one is there's no protection for overtime if you're working over the threshold number of hours. In addition to that, a lot of the independent contractors have to provide their own tools, their own supplies, there's no reimbursement for any of that. And the problem the employers run into is that if they exercise control, sufficient control over those workers, then they're not actually independent contractors. Right. For example, the, if they have to 
uh, work a set number of hours, if they have limitations on the different types of jobs they can take, if there's a lot of control over exactly how they perform their job, they're really employees. And as we know, the law applies, and all of those workers are entitled to those protections. It's a legal determination. The determination of the employer is irrelevant. It's That's a great point. Yeah, the, oftentimes the, we found our clients have signed contracts where they specifically waive their right to be an employee and they acknowledge that they're an independent contractor and the value of those is zero. Yeah, doesn't matter. In addition to waiving those rights, they sign arbitration agreements. Well, that's a great question. So currently in America, there's a big debate over whether arbitration agreements, which means you can't go to courts and you have to go to arbitration in a private setting, are even enforceable in an employment setting. Our Supreme Court is currently sitting on a case and going to decide it hopefully in the next six months that may very well affect whether or not arbitration agreements and class action waivers, what we typically do, are even enforceable in the employment setting.